Um, as far as some um, housekeeping things, um, just a reminder, like when you're submitting assignments, like for the lab activities specifically, I see like multiple assignments being submitted instead of in the same assignment, like attaching, you can attach more than one document in the same submission, I guess is what I'm trying to say, instead of submitting, um, like I saw yesterday, submitting notes and then going back and then submitting an image, the image of your drawing or whatever, looks like two assignments are submitted instead of just one. So if you could just submit whatever you need to submit in one submission, is this making sense? I don't know, okay. Um, if you have questions, let me know. We can you know, talk on the side about that or whatever. Um, but if you can do that, and if you could submit the assignments like up and down this way, like portrait and not sideways, because then I had to go like this, and I'm old and my neck hurts as it is. So um, if you can do that, that would be really helpful too. Um, and then here's the other thing. So we're going to kind of switch things up a little smidge starting Monday. So um, giving you the rest of the week to kind of mentally process these two things. The first thing is um, starting Monday, video on for each Zoom. If you don't have video, then you will, um, that will be assessed on your PPS. Okay. Um, the second thing is we are going to start having Surgical Tech Tuesdays, which means on Tuesdays we're in dress code. Yay! Okay, so um, moving into our core classes for this semester, um, SUR 140 comes first, don't ask me why, and then SUR 120. Um, there, we're going to start doing some lab stuff, and I want us, <laughs> yes, Rainy, from the waist up, just don't forget you have nothing from the waist down, and then, like, go get some coffee without turning off your video, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, um, and then, you know, uh, that'll help us get back into the groove for when we go to lab. Okay, um, so questions about those things. And then put stuff on waist down too when you come to lab, okay? I mean, I don't really care, but other people might care. <laughs> right? No glass tables, exactly. Um, let's see, what else was I going to say? in conjunction with that. Um, as far as labs moving forward, maybe I can pick your brain for just about five minutes, um, just kind of let you know where I'm going with my thoughts. But my thoughts are, I'm starting to look at all of the skills that we need to accomplish. And so this gets convoluted, but as it is, there are skills we need to do in 140 and 120. Now, there's a couple of ways that we can do it. We can pluck those skills out and throw them away and not do them until the very end when you get ready, getting ready to go to clinicals. And we can do all of those skills at the end, which is one option. Um, the other option is to, to come to campus in small groups, okay? And what I was thinking was breaking you into four small groups, dividing you evenly, and then two groups would come on Tuesdays for two hours each, and two groups would come on Thursdays for two hours each. There are some skills that we could potentially do at home, like hand wash and open glove, like passing instruments, um, loading a scalpel, kind of scary, but we can do it at home. We can do passing of that as well. So I've been looking through those and kind of identifying things that we could do at home if I put together a little kit for you. And then the thought would be, um, 
the first time that you come for labs, whatever that is, I can situate it that way because there's some stuff we just can't do at home, right? Like transfer the patient from gurney to OR table. We can't do that at home. So we have to do that at campus. Um, but we can prepare ourselves, you know, and have an understanding of it before we get there. And then you can get your kits when you come. Um, and then the thought would be like for hand wash open glove, we, I would teach it to you and you would practice at home and then you would video it and upload it to YouTube, post the link and I would critique it as your checkoff as a virtual simulation. So those are some of my thoughts, or we can do all of them on campus. That is all of those skills on campus. That's also another option. So speak now or forever hold your peace. What are your thoughts? I feel like personally, I would rather do as many on campus as I could, just okay. personally. I do like small groups. Okay. I would also rather go on campus. Okay. Mm, me, me as well. It'd be nice to have your in-person critique rather than the after the fact. So like as we're in the middle of popping those gloves open to have you say, wait, 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 put your thumbs down closer or, you know, whatever, so that it's fresh. Okay. Understood. Yeah. It looks like I have a lot, a lot of you are saying campus is good. Okay. All right, well, let me just say this. Hold on one second. Let me look at what Ian is saying. <laughs> well, maybe we can come uh, to some sort of compromise, but I, I like the idea of skills being in person too. Um, but um, we're really not that scary, Ian, like once you get to know us. That's the real reason right there. Uh-huh, well, guess what? As of uh, Scrub Tech Tuesday, you're gonna have to. <laughs> uh-uh, that's cheating, Ian. Okay, I appreciate your feedback. I appreciate your input. Um, <clears throat> So let me just add this little caveat. If there are any of you that um, if when we get to the point where we're coming to campus in small groups and you do not feel comfortable coming to campus, um, you don't have to. I can't make you come to campus if you don't feel comfortable because of the COVID situation. However, you do need to know, even though there's not going to be a penalty per se, it could postpone your progress in the program as far as when we get closer to clinicals. Okay, so that's the trade-off. You're not going to get withdrawn from the program if you don't come to labs. And in this situation, I can't make you come to labs. In this situation, we want you to be comfortable. However, I want to um, encourage you to keep a couple things in mind. One, you've signed up for a career in a field where you're going to be exposed to every bug under the planet. Is it not better to practice and put into place best practices now in a lab setting before you have to go out there? So, those are my only thoughts. Like eventually we're gonna have to go through the doors of an OR and that is the, that it's full of COVID people. <laughs> it's full of HIV people. It's full of C. diff people. It's full of MRSA people, oh, TB, whatever. Everything that we've been talking about. Um, so, you know, I would like to be able to have you in campus in small groups where we can make sure that we're putting our PPE on uh, in a way that's going to protect us, taking it off in a way that's going to protect us. So um, I respect whatever your decisions are. If something like that is the case and you don't feel comfortable, please just reach out to me personally um, and, you know, we'll kind of go from there. But um, 
you know, like I said, the, the consequence of that is that it could delay progress in your program as far as getting you out to clinicals. That's, that's the rub, okay? This is what we do. This is what we do, right? We're, we're the, the front lines. So, Tori, what I'm thinking about is each of you would be on campus once a week, either a Tuesday or a Thursday. I don't have it chiseled in stone yet, but just kind of looking at the days we have and looking, uh, estimating the times we would need to kind of get through our skills. I'm thinking um, four groups and each group would be on campus two hours a week, either Tuesday or Thursday. That's what we're looking at. Yep, yep, yep. Any other questions about these fun things? For the, the days that you said, Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, will we need to like um, ask you or you're gonna assign which day? I haven't decided yet. Um, I thought about putting another Google Doc together and having you sign up for like either Tuesday 8 to 10, Tuesday 10 to noon, Thursday, same thing, um, or just randomly assigning you. Um, no, we're not going to rotate. Probably won't rotate. We're probably just going to be um, in a group and we'll be in that group, I don't know, indefinitely. I see the benefit of rotating so that you're working with other individuals, but I also see the benefit of cohesiveness that you will develop with your, your team. So I kind of see both sides of that, but my thinking right now is we're gonna stay, we're gonna stay in an assigned group and we'll see how that goes, okay? Other questions, comments, <clears throat> violent reactions? Okay. Um, what? Sorry, when did you, um, when are you gonna start that? I'm pretty excited, I wanna go back to that. <laughs> so this class ends, I believe, on the 27th. I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, let's see, I can look right here. Hold on one sec, stand by. Um, yeah, so we finish up micro on the 27th. I think we get the first three hours of class on the 27th of July. And then that last hour is like intro to SUR 140. So it will, you know, the classes will start and end on the same day. Um, so potentially that first lab day could be the 28th. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, the 28th. That's the first Tuesday of class. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So what do you guys think? Do you want me to put together a Google Doc or do you just want me to randomly assign? You don't care. Probably Google Doc since I'd have to sign up for 8 to 10. <laughs> Why? Uh, I have things. Uh, what about school? School true. is supposed to be 8 to 12, Monday through Friday for the next year and a half of your life. And that's, uh, th that's been the plan. But now that I have to work from home, uh, I have to drive all the way back and uh, do some preparation stuff for that. So it's easy when I'm like at school home right now, and then I just have to run upstairs. There's not many much prep I have to do. Just 30 minutes of stuff, but. So what are you going to do when we're in class full time? I can't wait because then I'll probably be at work full time. Okay. I, I'm excited because I've worked like right across the street from the school and it works for so perfect. Okay. Understood. Why do I need to slap you, Tori? What'd you do? You need, do you need reprimanding? 
I don't do that. I'm not the mom. I'm just the teacher. All right. Um, okay. Nobody else really cares about how we do groups. A, do, a Google Docs easy for me. I can just do it like we did before and give you guys the link. So, um, so I'll do that. Um, it might be a minute before you see that because I need to firm up the lesson plan first. Um, and then once I do, then I'll, I'll make that. And I'm, I'll let you know, okay, when it's ready. Ms. Windsor, is Ms. Jackson in you two gonna be doing lab or just you? Just me, sorry. Oh, okay. You're just stuck with me. Oh no, I wouldn't mind both. <laughs> Yeah, she's really great too. And actually, um, that's a very valid question because I had conversations with her about um, either sharing the lab responsibilities or having her do the lab and I do the theory so that I could have Tuesdays and Thursdays to do program stuff because I, I don't have too much time to do that. Um, but uh, the, uh, the problem is, not a problem, it's a great thing. Um, cohort three is getting ready to go out to clinicals in September. And before you go out to clinicals, you have to have something called the terminal checkoff. And that means you do a case, um, a mock surgery, and uh, you're evaluated. And you have to get a 77% or better on that terminal checkoff to be cleared to go to clinicals. So that shows that you've demonstrated competency in your skills. And um, so Mrs. Braunbeck and Ms. Jackson will be doing terminal checkoffs um, in the mornings. And so that doesn't leave Ms. Jackson with a lot of um, class prep time if I have her covering these labs as well. So we decided that, you know, I would cover them and she could cover um, the terminal checkoff, she could help Mrs. Brombeck with that. So yeah, that's, that's the reason why she's not helping out, but it is her favorite part. And at some point there may come a time when she's doing all the lab across the board and I'm doing all the theory across the board. So I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, but anyways, we, we might head in that direction at some point. Oh, how exciting for them. <laughs> I know, right? Hopefully we just get clinical sites. Banner, I just got 12 emails from Banner, different Banner facilities that they are not taking students. They were supposed to start taking them again on the 17th of August and they said we've decided not to and we don't know when we are going to. So that's 12 clinical sites that just disappeared. Oh my gosh. Yeah, my mom was telling me about that, like the students that they had to her for to doing clinicals that they're not doing it right now. She yeah. said um, that they were going to start maybe back in August to start doing that, but they weren't sure about it. Yeah. So, Hospitals have pretty much canceled most of their elective surgeries at this point. And so that means we don't have cases to do. And if we have cases to do, then, you know, there's no point of us being there. So, um, so I don't know. I, I was talking with my, my mentor, Dr. Colazzo. She's been helping me and mentoring me throughout my doctoral studies. And she is the director of nursing for Estrella Community College. And she said, um, theoretically, if, because they're not getting any clinical sites, she's like, there's none to be found. And so, their students are doing all simulation. And she said that if things don't change in the spring, um, she could have students graduating as nurses having never delivered patient care on a real person. And I was, I was talking to Mrs. Brombeck about that yesterday and I started to get choked up like as it was coming out, like I started to feel myself like, like I wanted to cry. I was like, I just, I can't believe what's happening and how does that impact nursing care? And she said her newest graduates, um, you know, she said as soon as they were hired by facilities, they sent, 
literally sent them straight to the COVID floors. So, I mean, it's just how it's changing our healthcare is really scary. But is it going to be hard to get hired by like hospitals and clinics if it, it does go that way? Or do you think they'll just do the training? <laughs> like I, more intensive training? I think they're going to be in a situation where they don't have a choice. Like they're, they're, they're starving for nurses. They're starving for surge techs. Like all of ours, but two are hired at this point uh, of the 17 that have been impacted the most at this point. Um, before they were even graduated, they were hired. Like they're snatching them up. Like, you know, they're going out of style. Um, and, uh, they're they're gonna have to shoulder that responsibility of of training like it's changing the entire landscape of how we do things um you know so i i don't think uh, employment is going to be a problem like it, if anything they're going to need to hire more than they already do need to hire um so I mean, I hate to say it, but I guess they're going to have to take what they can get, right? And then finish the training, um, you know, as needed. Um, but then I saw Ian's comment says, if we don't have places for clinicals, what is the school's plan for continuing the program? Um, so <sighs> the plan is, so if hospitals cancel all sur all elective surgeries, there really isn't anything we can do except for push pause. Um, however, what Mrs. Brombeck is continuing to do is um, like the smaller facilities like plastics and orthopedic centers and um, centers that do eyes and those kinds of things, she is literally like piecemealing clinicals together. So a student might have to go to this facility to get ortho cases, this facility to get eye cases, this facility to get, you know, so we can get four specialties because that's what ASC says we have to have and a general, a general um, surgery component. So, um, you know, they're out there. It's a, it's a, um, a smaller caseload. And so I mean, she's a miracle worker. I'm going to tell you, Tori, like she's, she's fantastic. Like I'm so shocked, like by the end of this month, like all of our, all of our cohort two will be graduated. Um, and that just, you know, at first when we were starting to look at it, I'm like, I don't even know how we're going to get them graduated before cohort three goes out, but she has just done an amazing job. Um, yeah. So the, the worst case scenario is going to be piecing together the clinical experience. And at some point, um, AST is going to have to do something. They're going to have to lower the case requirement from 120 to something else, or they're going to have to allow us to do virtual simulations of some sort. You know, like you do so many mock procedures in the lab and that counts. I mean, something is going to have to give because if it doesn't, like we're not the only surge tech program in, in this vice, like they all are. So how are you going to get surge techs if you don't make some sort of, you know, concessions? So at some point, something's going to have to move um, and shift and, and it will, it, it just, you know, win. So, so that's my long and short answer, Ian. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, Alyssa, I was just reading your comment. Yeah, it's, you know, um, if we don't have people to replace the people, you know, we're, we're in trouble. It, it's crazy. And yeah, it's crazy. It, it's just, you know, living in the moment. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about chapter 15, shall we? Oh, Alyssa, you have your little baby. She's so adorable. 
she can learn some micro. Can you say gram negative cockeye? Hi. <laughs> um, okay, so let's kind of shift gears to that. What did you think about chapter 15? We talked about some STDs. I know they are hard to pronounce. Meningitis. Okay, you, you look what I did on my book. You guys are gonna laugh at me. So I can know how to pronounce Neisseriaceae. Okay, wait for it. Okay, Neisseriaceae. Okay, like, you know, I'm like, oh my God, is that an E or an I? Like, I don't, I can't remember how to pronounce that. Like, okay. Some of them are kind of tricky. Others, I, I got the hang of it. But uh, I don't want to sound like a complete doof when I'm doing the um, lecture <laughs> any more than I already do. <laughs> but you guys probably already know I'm crazy. Paladum, paladum. It's like paladum, paladum, oxen free. Remember Ollie Ollie Oxen Free? Okay. Um, what we're gonna focus on is um, the a, a surgical aspect regarding one of these um, unpronounceable bugs, as Rainy says. Oh, good! You're getting a new laptop. That will be awesome, Robbie. That's fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to divide you up into some groups. Um, I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to do your group work, then we'll take a break, then we'll come back, we'll talk about our stuff. Okay, so um, how many groups did I say that I need? Hold on one second. Five. Okay, I'm going to do five groups as soon as I find the thing to click on. Okay. All right, group one, Ariana, Jacob, Robbie, Sean, Tallman. And let's see, who hasn't been in charge for a while? Tallman, do you wanna be in charge in there? Thank you. Okay, group two, we have Alexis, Alyssa, Gabe, and Jonathan. Alexis, would you be able to kind of take the reins in there? Thank you. If, if you need to like do some computer work, I'm sure somebody else in there can help you out with that as well. Can team up. Uh, group three, Ian, Jackie, Lixie, and Wendy. Ian, do you want to take the reins in there? Are you Darian? Oh, okay. Okay. All we can do is try. You guys can co co lead. Maybe somebody else will, will volunteer. Um, room four: Ivana, Rainy, Sarah, and Tori. Who hasn't gone for a while? Um. How about Sarah? Can you be the group leader in there? Thank you. And then our last group, um, Adriana, Andrea, Rulon, and Tammy. And so how about Tammy? Will you be the lead in there? Yep, no problem. Thank you, dear. Okay, now for the objectives, group one. We are going to start with the under the microscope questions on page 228. So group one, you have one and two. Those should just be quick, easy things for you to find out. Um, group two is gonna go with questions three and four, okay? Group three, I want you to dig up some information on pelvic inflammatory 
disease. Okay, and then maybe specifically focus in on um, complications that would result in surgery. We're interested about surgery. We're not interested about them going to the doctor and getting an antibiotic and going home. Okay, so um, so focus on when you're when you're doing your research for for PID. Focus on complications that would result in surgery. Okay, and then just tell us what those are. Okay, you don't have to go into the surgeries. Just do some legwork. Um, group four. Group four. You're gonna find a video on ruptured ectopic pregnancy due to gonorrhea. Okay. Um, if you can't, just a ruptured ectopic is fine. Um, and then group five, you're going to find a video as well, but that video is going to be um, a tuboplasty. And we're talking fallopian tubes here. So uh, that means it, they either had a ruptured ectopic and now they need to fix the tube to try to save it and restore patency, or they had their tubes tied and now they're getting them reversed. Either way, find, see what you can find for a tuboplasty. It, uh, it might also be called salpingostomy. I'm not sure. I did find one on tuboplasty, um, so maybe poke around. If you need help, let me know. Okay, that's our objectives. Questions about that? Okay, so um, I'll give you 10 minutes to do your legwork, and then I'll bring you back, and we'll go take a break, and then we'll talk about what you guys found out, okay? All right, here we go. Have fun. Be good. All right, we're going to start with group one, and that was Tallman's group. Uh, what did you guys find out about post-op diagnosis and type of infection? Are you out there? Who else was in Tallman's group? I was in her group. She, I think she wrote down, but I don't know if she's in right now. Uh, I had my headphones off. Oh, uh, are we ready? All right. We're ready. Okay. Uh, so to answer the first question, what might the post-operative diagnosis be for what the surgeon found? Uh, the issue could have been from an STD or post-surgery infection that led to a pelvic inflammatory disease that created tubal infections. And while the body is trying to repair the injured tissue, the structures in the pelvis begin to stick to other structures in the same area during the healing process, so scar tissue. Um, and with, a, with the with surgery, abdominal surgery, every time an incision is made, the patient could be at risk of developing um, adhesion problems. Yes. And to prevent the 
um, the tubal infections, um, it's best to get early treatment and um, uh, and to prevent the STD <laughs> by having safe sex practice. <laughs> And also during surgery, the surgeon should be careful with his, his like technique, surgical technique, to reduce trauma. Yeah. Good. Very good. What about, um, what do you think was the likely culprit of the infection if you had to identify a um, specific microorganism? Gonorrhea was what we read. Yeah, I would agree with that too. Yep, awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much. Questions or comments about that? All right, good job. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to move along to Alexis's group. Um, they had questions three and four. What did you guys find out? All right, so um, for number three, it's like, uh, what impact might the disease process have on her ability to become pregnant? And so it would make it more difficult for like the egg to enter the fallopian tube. So it's going to be difficult to conceive and it can also result in like, in, um, it's called an atopic, in, I don't know if I'm saying that word right, entopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Atopic. Ectopic pregnancy. Or she can become like infertile. Like there's a lot of complications with it. Mm -hmm. um, and number four, how did the patient likely become infected initially? And so she has like, um, it's most likely pelvic inflammatory disease. So that's a result from like undiagnosed or untreated um, gonorrhea due to having unprotected Yes, that's all. Back to that again. <laughs> I want to take away all the fun. Okay, good. Very good. Excellent. Yes, you guys are absolutely spot on. Thank you so much. Okay, questions, comments about that? My dog is barking at something. Um, okay, group three. That was Ian's group. Um, and you guys are talking about what is pelvic inflammatory disease and what surgeries could it lead to potentially? So, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. So, um, Pelvic inflammatory disease is an infection of the female reproductive organs. It is a common illness, and it's uh, diagnosed in more than 1 million women each year in the United States. Um, PID occurs when bacteria from the vagina and cervix uh, upward into the uterus, ovaries, or fallopian tubes. And some complications of PID that can result in surgery um, if you're getting diagnosed for PID, you may need an endometrial biopsy in order to figure out uh, if you have it and what's causing it. Um, as said, um, sometimes with PID, it can lead to the formation of abscesses in uh, the fallopian tubes, which could require a laparoscopy to remove and or drain. Um, sometimes with um, PID, it can result in scar tissue that would also have to be surgically removed. And in some instances of recurrent and very uh, recurrent PID, especially in cases where people do not respond to antibiotics, they may require, let me just pull it up so I don't mess up the pronunciation. Oh, and I lost it. What's that? Oh, come on. Just had it. Okay. Um, in as I was just saying, in some cases where it is recurrent and very problematic, and people don't respond to antibiotics, it may result in needing unilateral salpingo oophorectomy or a hysterectomy. 
And those are some, that's PID and complications that can lead in sur lead to surgery. Very good. I agree completely. I, one of the things that we want to think about as surge techs is uh, when, uh, now in these times, right, the, they want to do minimally invasive procedures, if at all possible. And so if that means laparoscopy and um, there is a situation such as this where um, you know that it's for PID or you hear them saying, well, I, you know, I think she's, she probably has a lot of adhesions in there or something like that. In your surge tech brain, you should think laparoscopy to laparotomy, right? Anytime you do a laparoscopy, you should be prepared to what we call go open. Okay, so anytime it's minimally invasive, laparoscopy, looking into the belly, there is a chance that we're gonna have to convert to an open procedure, where, which means we take out the scope and we make a big incision and we dig around in there to see what's going on. Um, but with adhesions, that's, that even becomes a higher probability because I've seen instances where they, um, maybe not specifically for PID, but they've had multiple procedures or they have some sort of infection from something else, peritonitis in their abdomen, and they put the first port in right below the belly button is where they typically put it. They put the scope in, they take a look, and it is like, I don't even know. I'm trying to think of an analogy. Like webs of adhesions everywhere. Like you can't even see, you know, half an inch in front of your face because there's just all these little bands of tissue everywhere. Um, if there's a few, they might be able to get in another port and like take, take them down, right? So that they can see and work. But if they look in and there's tons of adhesions everywhere, um, they're just gonna take the scope out and they're gonna want a, a scalpel. Okay, yes, rainy, absolutely. Flying through a cloud, I love it. Um, so that's something that we always want to keep in the back of our mind, right? We want to have stuff in the operating room for a possible open, right? You have a major tray, you have a whatever you think, whatever the case is, right? Our trays, we kind of pick according to that with some open supplies just on hand, because if you do have to convert to that, um, you know, you're going to need different supplies. So just a little shout out as far as that goes. You know, that's what we want to always think about. Okay, questions about that? Good job, Ian and team. Thank you so much. Questions, comments? Before we get to, this is, we're getting down to the fun part now, watching surgeries. Okay. All right. So, Sarah, your group um, looked for a ruptured ectopic. Were you successful? Uh, yeah, Rainy's going to share her screen. Okay. Or if you want, the link is just on um, our conversation. Do you want to copy it and just share it on yours so you don't have to do the back and forth? I mean, I'm happy either way. I, I don't think I have your conversation from your group. It doesn't come onto the main chat, but if you could copy and paste it into the chat, I'd be more than happy to. Oh, sure. Okay. Share it. <clears throat> Yeah. All right, give me one second to get this queued up here for you. Pause. Who wants to go without us? All right, here we are. We have arrived today. Hello, this is a case of ruptured ectopic pregnancy. This patient is a young woman and she has a severe pain. Now, ultrasound has shown right side ruptured ectopic. So we are introducing the various needle over the inferior crease of umbilicus. Maybe I should just give you commentary of my own. Can you guys hear me? 
Okay. Um, so this that he's putting in right here under the belly button, that's called the varies needle, V-E-R-E-S, varies needle. And it's going, it goes all the way through the abdominal wall. It has a special little tip, whereas you're pushing it through, once it pops through, you feel like a little pop because the tip kind of like um, is a little springy at the end. And um, if you saw, hold on one second. Let me see if I could, oh no, oh no, oh no, I did something. Um, hold on one sec. I want to show you um, where he put the, yeah, okay, right here. See, he's attaching a syringe there. The reason that he's doing that is uh, most of the time as the surge check, you're, uh, depending on your surgeon's preference, you're going to fill that with air or saline, and they're going to attach it to this little, this little thing right here with the lure lock is called a stop cock because this has like a little on and off switch. And um, so they're gonna attach the syringe there and they're gonna try to push some of the air or fluid, whatever it is. And if it goes easily, because they don't have eyeballs, right, to see if they're through, this is essentially going to tell them if they're all the way through the abdominal wall in to the abdomen. Okay, um, so then once they um, determine that, then they're going to insufflate, okay, which means they're going to put carbon dioxide into the abdomen to like bring the abdominal wall up off from the contents of the abdomen, okay? That's where we're at. Okay, so we're going to do that. And usually they'll put two clamps, those are Alice's, but sometimes towel clips, and they're gonna pull up on the abdominal wall as they put that. Now that's showing the pressure in the abdomen. So that's the insufflator, kind of like Blair Witch. Okay, um, so you can see right here, let me pause. You can see it's set at 15 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So that's what it's set at. This, this is a machine that's pumping out the CO2. And there's a sterile tubing that we throw off. We keep part of it. Circulator hooks up the other part to the, um, it's called the insufflation machine. And this is what the actual pressure is in there right now. All right. And then this is the flow, how fast it's going. Okay. So um, it's going to get up to 15 because that's what it's set at. The belly's gonna look like a big balloon. It's kind of fun to thump on. It's kind of like a watermelon, you know? Okay, so that's the incision. Mm, I think it's right below the belly button. And this is the trocar that he's putting in. Now, this is an outer sheath called an obturator. And then a part goes inside of that Call, um, called the trocar, and it has like a pokey pointy tip. Now in the US, we pretty much use disposable ones, um, but there are some instances where they use non-disposable. And this is an example of a non-disposable one. They're gonna shove this down through the abdominal wall now that they have their pneumoperitoneum. Try not to shove it through the aorta or the bowel. We don't want to do that. That's, that's bad form. Okay, so now you're looking at the uterus. Uterus there. I don't know. Looks like ovary there, maybe. You can see it. The tubes are kind of hidden. So a lot of times when they do these, there's going to be an apparatus, a device that they put in the vagina and um, they're, they clamp like, um, it's called a single tooth tenaculum. So hold on one second. Let me pause this for a second. See, um, mm, no, so that's not a very good view now at this point. Um, let me see. 
Yeah, so see how this uterus is like way lifted up now? That's because they put, they put something that's sort of like a joystick into the vagina. And there is a tenaculum that they clip onto the cervix and then that device hooks onto it. And you might be like driving the uterus, like from the outside of the body with that. I know they do slosh our organs around, right? They don't even care. It's just like shaken, not stirred. All right, so that's the broad ligament. Remember back to our anatomy, the ovarian ligament lives in the broad ligament. There's the ectopic. He's using like a ligature cautery type device to ligate and divide the ligament along the tube. Bye bye tube. I just throw it down there for a while. So that is called an endo catch. Um, it's a little baggy that's loaded into like this long cylindrical device and the baggy will unfurl. You'll see here in a second and they'll be able to put the specimen into it close the bag, and then remove the whole thing from the abdomen, theoretically. <clears throat> there's like on the outside by the handle, there's like a little string that you undo and, um, this one looks like it's the same. You pull the string and it kind of is like a little purse string, closes it like a satchel, see there? And then they can just pull that whole thing out. It's a common practice. Sometimes you might have something that's bigger than the incision. And so then they have to fuss and fight for a while um, to get it out. And sometimes as a last resort, they will make the incision bigger if they can pull it out through that hole. Ta-da. Gotta wash. Gotta wash it out, make sure there's no bleeding. <clears throat> so sometimes when you um, first get a look into the abdomen of um, a patient where they have PID, you're going to see like these green lakes of fluid like around the, the side walls, right? Because that's like, you know, pussy infection. Um, and so, yeah, so sometimes they'll do some irrigating and washing and, you know, first, uh, and then they're going to finish up with more uh, after that. That's the liver right there that you're looking at, that big brownish thing.
back at the uterus. That yellow stuff is just fatty tissue, omentum or whatever. Down under there, that space under the uterus, they call that the cul-de-sac. So if you hear that term. Awesome. Okay, comments, questions? Observations? So my only question on that is that it was you know, designated a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So I really expected to see the fallopian tube actually like, you know, exploded essentially, but it, it wasn't, it was still all intact. So um, is that more common to have either, you know, it's still encapsulated or do you see it where it does like fully rupture into the abdominal cavity? You can definitely see both. I don't know if one happens more over the other, um, but I've definitely seen both scenarios. Um, if they are ruptured, that is an extreme emergency because there's going to be hemorrhaging associated with that. Um, you know, we we prefer to do them when they're not ruptured because that's not as an emergent type situation. Um, so that's better. That's a better situation for the patient. Um, but um, I wouldn't say, I don't know, without doing some research and looking at some statistics, but in my experience, it seems like it's kind of a flip of a coin, um, you know, just depending on maybe how long did they put up with the pain or, <laughs> you know, like those kinds of things, the awareness, you know, the patient's awareness of their own body or whatever the case may be. Um, and so it, it, it depends on, you know, the age of the patient, how do they have children, whatever, like the, the surgeon and the patient are going to decide what's the best approach as far as do we just take the entire tube and ovary? Do we um, remove the ectopic and try to repair? the fallopian tube, um, those kinds of things. So, I, and I have seen it both ways as far as that goes as well. Good question, yeah. Other questions or observations? Could you guys recognize the anatomy as you were looking at it? Was was that a that was a like a manual laparoscopic without the robotic, right? Correct. Was, no it, robotics. Wow. Mm -hmm. That was my first time seeing that without without the Da Vinci. Yeah. Um, you know, that I don't know. Uh, I would say the Da Vinci isn't used as much as just regular laparoscopy, arthroscopy. You know, there are certain things that they use the Da Vinci for and they use it like standard, like prostatectomies, I think kind of standard across the board now. Um, you know, they use the Da Vinci if they can, but yeah. Oh good, you recognize the liver, awesome. Good job. And you guys, you know, you'll, you'll train your eyes. But always keep like in your mind, like as you're watching, like, you know, continue to kind of think, oh, and identify, and, you know, those kinds of things, because that's going to help you even watching videos, you can train your eyes, you know, to be able to see and recognize what the anatomy is. If you can't, then you can anticipate, right, what the surgeon's going to need next. It's like, if I see bleeding, I can anticipate he's probably going to want something to stop it. But, you know, what tissues are we working on and where are we working also helps for us to understand what instrument's going to come next, right? Is it tough tissue? Is it fibrous tissue? Is it delicate tissue? 
um, you know, those kinds of things are going to direct us and guide us. Are they down deep? Are they superficial? Those kinds of things can give us really good clues. Anything else about this one? If it is a ruptured ectopic and the patient is hemorrhaging, they're probably not going to opt for a laparoscopy. It's probably, it's going to be a lot faster for us to throw a drape on, get a scalpel, cut down, and the first thing that we're going to do is stop the bleeding. Then we can breathe and figure out what we're going to do from there. But it's like what, if you have a ruptured aorta, right? We're not going to mess around with a minimally invasive surgery. We need to get in there and stop the bleeding. And then we can figure out what we need to do next. So chances are, if it's a ruptured ectopic and the patient is hemorrhaging, they're just going to go for an open ectopic. Okay. All right. Great job. Good find. Good video. Thank you, Sarah's group. Okay, Tammy, last but not least. So we had a, a laparoscopy scalping ostomy, um, ostomy, and um, it was somewhat similar, but it was it was also unruptured ectopic tubal. So um, if you don't mind, I appreciate how you narrated. So may I send you the link as well? Absolutely. Thank you. Alexis, you cracked me up. Get in, stop the bleeding, play with the organs. Yes, that's the fun part. Play around. Okay, one second. Oh, while I get this up. Oh, hey, it's got good music. Okay, let me find you guys again. Okay, here you are. Let me share this with you. Play. Ooh, the ultrasound. Turn down the violins just a little bit. Can see it there. Ectopic. This is the uterus. <laughs> That's a little bit fuzzy. Okay, so let me just say something about the fuzziness. So an interesting thing happens. Okay, picture this. You're wearing glasses, okay? The dishwasher has just finished working and you need a cup out of there. It's your favorite cup. You open it up and the steam comes out and what happens to your glasses? <laughs> they fog over, right? Same thing happens with the scope when you stick it in the belly. The scope is cold. OR 65 to 75 degrees. It's typically not as hot as 75. Um, but it's colder outside, regardless, uh, in the OR environment than it is in the belly, right? So it's going to fog up. So there's a couple things that we can do. Uh, one, we have these awesome things called scope warmers. It's amazing. It's like this long, floppy, plasticky thing, and it's filled with uh, fluid, and it has this little disc inside it. And when you crack the disc, it causes a chemical reaction, and it, the stuff inside gets hot. And you can lay your scope in there and fold it over. It's like a little scope taco. And then uh, you just keep that up on your mayo stand until it's time for you to put the scope in the belly and then you take it out, put it in the belly and you're good. There's also some stuff that we use called Indofog and it helps with the fog as well. But sometimes even still, when you stick it in there, there gets schmutz on it, for lack of a better word. Um, and sometimes you'll see them like rub it, the end of it on the contents of the abdomen. You'll see that. Okay, moving forward. It looks like, uh, so a lot of times us as surge techs, we drive the camera. 
Okay, so we're the eyeballs for the surgeon. Not only are we the eyeballs for the surgeon, we're also passing them instruments, right? So you have to keep where they're working centered with the camera, and you also have to be able to effectively get them things. Multitasking. This is a hook cautery that this individual is using, that Bernie thing with a hook on the end. Okay, and then these are just some graspers. They might look like they're right angles. There's the ectopic. This, um, these dissectors that they're using, they're called Marilyn, like the name Marilyn. Suction irrigation there. Fluid always drains into that cul-de-sac in the pelvis, so. Ooh, now they're gonna suture it. This is so fun. This is a, a special laparoscopic suture. It's not the type of suture that we would use for an open something. And that's a needle holder, a laparoscopic needle holder that's on the right. Watch him tie the knot, that's the funnest part. Hey, play video games, it will help you. It's the hand-eye coordination thing going on. Isn't that awesome? Someone needs to suction. Now, in other situations where we're doing laparoscopy for like um, a colon resection or something like that, they have a special port called a hand port, and it's about that big and it allows them to put one hand in <laughs> and it tightens down around their wrist so you don't lose your pneumoperitoneum and so it's really weird to see on the screen that they have one hand working in there with their laparoscopic instruments and one surgeon I worked with she'd want to stuff laps in there too uh, so yeah you gotta watch them like a hawk I'm telling you Stitching it up. That's awesome. So that stitch that this doctor is doing is called a locking stitch because he's running it through the loop before he like pulls it tight. Um, and so that's referred to as a locking stitch. That one was not locking, that one's regular unless he's gonna run it through right now, yeah, maybe. No, he's just gonna tie it. He, she, whoever. That's awesome. I'm always amazed when I see him like, suture with no hands using these instruments. It's so amazing with, um, Rotator cuff repairs, it's really amazing too. They have special instrumentation to tie knots inside the shoulder when they're doing like arthroscopy, arthroscopic repairs. Um, and I think it's really fascinating too to do that. Now they gotta cut it. Okay. 
a lot of these instruments, well, not a, a lot, a fair amount of the laparoscopic instruments we use are disposable. And so they're single use items only. That's a right angle dissector where it's poking, poking the uterus with it. There's the endo catch. Or it has various names depending on what manufacturer makes it, but it's like birthing a baby through a really small hole. <laughs> Rainy, I just saw your comment. At least she's not trying to eat strawberry jelly or grape jelly. <laughs> I could totally be eating. I have no problem with it. But um, I know I'm, I'm crazy. As Tammy's son says, he's right. It's a true story. Okay. So um, one of the things that that didn't show that they do sometimes is um, inject some uh, dye into the tube just to test for patency, right? Because if, um, if the tube is going to work again and be patent and viable, we sometimes want to test our repair. Right, so um, they'll use something like um, indigo carmine or methylene blue. Those are two dyes that they'll use commonly. They're soup like dark, dark, dark blue dyes. Um, and you'll get that onto your field and you'll draw it up in a syringe. Um, and they can inject it in and just see if any of it leaks out. Um, just, you know, as a little test. Um, but then they need to tell the patient that they're gonna have green urine because it does, <laughs> it does filter out. Um, and it, it, yellow and blue makes green, so um, yeah. So comments about those or questions? All this talk about food, I feel like I need a snack. So my question is, is it pretty easy to hold the scope still? I mean, like if you're in this one position or, you know, I mean, do you have a tendency to kind of like, as you're reaching over to grab an instrument, I mean, are you, you know? Yeah, it's hard. It is hard because there isn't really anything, um, sorry, somebody's calling me. There isn't really any place for you to like steady your arm or rest it. You know, so, um, so yeah, there can be a bit of movement and it's really hard because they don't want you to move at all, but you're trying to hold that and watch the screen and you're like, okay, I know I got it here somewhere. Okay, okay here you go. Center me, center. Okay, okay. You know, and so it's, it's, uh, um, it takes practice. Um, and we definitely have all of that stuff in the lab and we'll get some practice with it. I don't make the tech hold it. I make the first assist hold the camera because in the lab, it's still so new and so fresh that it, it, it's so hard to do both at the same time until you really feel like you have your regular, you know, um, skills kind of mastered. Um, but we'll get an opportunity to drive the camera. I, I would say more difficult than just trying to stay still is um, trying to find, <laughs> trying to move in the right direction. Um, and the reason for that is something called the fulcrum effect. So if I were to just use my pin, let's see if I can, if you can pretend that, maybe this will work better this pencil's a little bit longer, that this is where I'm working outside of the body and this is where it is inside the body and I want to look to the right, I'm going to have to move my hand to the left 
to get this to move that direction. You see what I mean? So if I'm gonna go to the right, I need to move my hand in the opposite way, right? And that's called the fulcrum effect. If I wanna look down, I need to move my hand up. And if I wanna look up, I need to move my hand down. So outside of the body, you're doing the opposite movement of what, what you wanna look at. And so sometimes that can be a more tricky thing, that fulcrum effect, than, than anything else, you know? So, in my opinion. Yeah. Any other thoughts? All right. I agree, Alyssa, surgery is always fun to watch. It's more fun to do, just wait. It's gonna be awesome. All right, well, um, how about we take a break? Sound good, let's take a 10 minute break. Um, I have 11.03, so if you wanna come back around like 11.13-ish, um, and then we will pick up with some lab stuff, okay? All right, I will see you uh, in about 10 minutes. All right, it was a nice little 10 minute break. Okay, so we're gonna pick up with principle two and we're gonna talk about the next three sub principles. So now would be a good time to start your notes. Um, so like I said before, we kind of have talked about these already. So just a quick review and then one um, additional component that we're gonna bring in and then we'll look at some instruments. Um, so that first one is um, hand should never be allowed to fall below the waist or table level. Remember, we do work in this one small little space, right? Mid, uh, ch mid chest to waist, right? So if we are in surgery or we're scrubbed in and we drop our hand down to our side, contaminated. We can't do that. We have to keep them up here. Um, I did have a student once that was having a really difficult time keeping both arms up in that space at the same time. And uh, she did good for a while and then she'd forget, oh, I'm like, you can't drop your hand, you gotta keep straight. So um, anyways, my, my other faculty member at the time, this was in Tucson in my past life, um, worked with her and uh, they had a couple sessions together. And then the next time I did a mock procedure, she never missed a beat, never dropped a hand. I, she was cured. And uh, so later I had the conversation with my, my faculty person, Catherine. She's my good friend, actually. And I'm like, Catherine, what did you do? You know, and she said, I just told her to pretend like she's like the supporter, you know, like she's got to support the girls. And that's where she needs to stay, supporting the girls. I'm like, okay, and it seemed to work. So if that works to help you remember that you gotta support the girls, uh, if you don't have girls, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, the, what, never mind. So this is being recorded, so I, I gotta be careful. Um, so we want to make sure that we always keep our hands in our space. Um, but we can put them down to the back table, right? And the back table might not be waist level, right? It might be a little bit lower than that, but we can reach down there. Um, but that's the extent of it, okay? Questions about that? How high can we go? Like if we need to adjust the light or whatever, is there a? Yep, so um, that's definitely one exception, reaching for and adjusting the OR light. Here's the thing I would keep in mind, 
limit movements, which is another principle we'll get to down the line, but you just want to limit the amount of time that you're doing this because you are reaching out of your zone, as Tammy said, where you're, you're reaching outside of where we live, right? So um, we just want to make sure that we limit those movements. Yeah, um, I haven't really ever had a, I had one surgeon get on to me once um, because we were doing, um, I don't know, probably a breast augmentation or something like that, uh, or a breast reduction. They work on one breast and then they go around and you switch sides and they work on the other and then you switch sides and they go back to the other side and there is some of that. Um, and as they work back and forth, you adjust the light, like to the right or to the left. And I was doing that and he kind of got on to me and said, you know, technically it's not sterile when you reach up there. So don't adjust the light unless I ask you to. Okay, whatever. Um, but technically that falls to us. Like it's our responsibility, you know, a lot of times to adjust that light. Very carefully coordinated high fives. Yes, and chest bumps. Okay, don't forget that. Um, so when you're putting the light handle on, that's why I emphasized, if you remember in SUR 100 in the video, that it's a two part process, right? You want to reach up to put it on and then adjust the light to your field, not put it on, do something else, adjust it, do, you know, so you want to limit the amount of time that you that you're doing, uh, reaching up. Let me see what Alyssa says. Oh my gosh. Was the patient supposed to be under general anesthesia, typically with breast dogs? It's kind of scary. Usually we don't do those under local and it's too high to do it under spinal. Well, maybe Maybe she had an LMA. Sometimes they'll put in, uh, it's called an LMA, which is a laryngeal mask airway. And it, instead of being like the ET tube where it goes down between the vocal cords into the trachea, it actually sits on top. It's like a little inflatable doohickey with a tube on it. And it seats on top of the larynx over the, the glottis, right? the opening between the two. Um, and so if they inject a lot of local anesthetic, which they usually do, um, then they can probably have them under a light anesthetic where they're kind of spontaneously breathing on their own. Um, that's probably, that's probably the case is going to be my guess, but yeah, that's never good. Um, so questions about Questions about um, reaching up or reaching down. That was a great question, Rainy. Thank you for that. Any other thoughts? <clears throat> so the next one, um, there was a spoiler alert yesterday for this one. So the back of the gown isn't sterile. We had that already. Back of the gown's not considered sterile. Um, and because of that, we should never turn our back uh, towards the sterile field or any sterile thing, unless we are very far away. Um, what was I gonna say? The exception is those togas. Did you guys see on the threaded discussion? I actually posted it on responding to Rulan, but I don't know if you guys saw like the togas or not. Um, but there are these special togas that we wear that cover us from head to, all the way down um, and they zip in the back and typically we use those for total joint replacements and those are sterile in the back um, and so anyways there's conflicting evidence of whether they help prevent surgical side infections or not but whoever ties like when you're wearing a regular gown somebody that's not sterile you know, they just tie your gown. They fasten the Velcro, they tie the back, whatever. Um, but with those, they're supposed to put on a pair of sterile gloves and then zip it all the way down the back um, so that it does stay sterile. And um, so anyways, I guess those you can, you know, rub your butt up against your back table. But 
um, supposedly supposed to help with um, contamination or surgical side infections or whatever. You said they're called togos? Toga, yeah. You guys want to see a picture? Yes. Let me see if I can find a picture for you. This is one we're going to look at in a little bit, but let me see if I can find a... Um, Stand by. It's not a toka, something else. Okay, here we go. There's a bunch of pictures of them. This looks like a good picture. See, the, the awesome thing about this is you don't have to wear a mask. What it will typically do is, um, let's see if I can find a helmet that you can see here, this. So something similar to this or this, depending on which manufacturer uh, you look at, uh, they have these helmets. And so you're gonna get one of these helmets and you're gonna put it on your head and it has a little adjusty thing in the back so that it's snug on your head. Um, and then there's a battery pack that you'll get that has a little uh, cord and the cord attaches to the helmet and you just slip the battery pack in your pocket and that is going that's like runs a little fan inside there which is really nice because it helps to keep you cool but it makes it difficult to hear with those um, but you'll put this on first here's another example this blue one that you can see here um, and then if you work at a Scottsdale hospital, this is what they look like right here, the togas. No, just kidding. Um, so, so when you get ready to scrub, you're gonna put that helmet on because it's not sterile. You're gonna get your battery pack hooked up and you're gonna put a mask on, but just like loosely loop the strings in the back. You'll do your scrub, you'll go in, you'll put your toga on, which is, an act in itself. Um, and then when your nurse comes to tie you up, they will slip your mask out and toss that, get on their sterile gloves, zip you all the way down, and then you end up looking something like this. Ta da! In your toga. Um, is there a better like picture of the back of it? Here's him putting this on, him or her, whoever. Um, so sometimes there are two pieces, the part that goes over your, just a helmet and a part that goes over the helmet and then you put on a regular gown or sometimes it's all one piece like these guys. And um, so first what you have to do is there's a little hook on the front right here and this plastic shield is, you have to find the hook of it and you have to hook it on there and then you let the gown fall. You put your arms into it without them coming out, uh, your hands coming out. And then you're gonna still, while you have the sleeves over your hands, you're gonna get underneath that gown and you're gonna push it up over your head. And then your nurse is gonna come and get it and zip it, and pull, you know, pull it more on you and zip it down the back. So um, it can be kind of a fiasco. Um, I never really liked wearing them because I couldn't hear well in them, um, but orthopods like to use them for sure. Maybe some spine guys too, I don't know. Okay, so that's the toga party. Um, let me see, let me look at the chat. Hold on one second. Um, I thought Alexa said something. Yes, so why don't they wear gloves when closing the gowns to keep them sterile? Um, so they only do that with the togas. They don't with the, with the regular gowns. And they just, uh, and I think part of the reason why is they're really just like a, you know when you have those little sweaters or something that are like little wraps with the little tie, you know? Like that's kind of, that's what the back of the gown is. It's just the, the flap, one flap is at your back and the other one kind of closes around and you tie it at the side, but it's not like really sealed off. I think it's just kind of the way that they're made. They're just not designed for that. Does that answer your question? We're gonna 
Uh, okay, good. All right, awesome. Yeah, so back of the gown is not sterile unless we have that toga situation. Okay, and then the third one uh, that we're going to talk about today is um, a separate sterile surface should be used for gowning and gloving. We should not gown and glove off the back table. That's the takeaway from this one. Okay, the gown and gloves for us need to be opened um, in a sterile fashion, and typically the mayo stand is where we do it. I'm going to show you that in just a second, um, or a smaller little table. But the mayo stand is typically where we're going to open our own gown and gloves. Everybody else's can go on the back table because we're going to be responsible for gowning and gloving everybody else in our team that is going to be a sterile team member. Okay. So let me go back here. Wait for that little bar to disappear. And I'll sneak in over here okay so this is the this is the mayo stand right here so let me set the stage of when when we do this so when we are getting ready for a case first thing we're gonna do is gather all of our supplies and our instrumentation if it's already gathered for us, that's great. There's gonna be a preference card, a sheet uh, of some kind printout that says all the things that you need for that surgery. And so your first objective is going to be to check to make sure you have everything that you need, okay? Once you have checked to make sure that you have everything that you need, then, um, you're going to position your furniture, so your back table's going to be the center, a mayo stand, a ring stand, whatever. You're going to lay your stuff out. You're going to check your integrity of your packaging, okay? Um, and then you're going to make sure you have on your mask before you start opening. You don't have to have a mask on in the OR 100% of the time. You have to have it on before you open sterile supplies, or if you're going into a room where sterile things are already open or there's a surgery in progress, you wanna have that mask on, okay? So you're gonna mask up, you're gonna open all of your supplies, and <clears throat> excuse me, as you're doing that, one of the things is gonna be your gown and gloves. Nobody thinks about your gown and gloves. It's not gonna be in your stuff unless somebody loves you a lot and they knew you were gonna be in there and so they pulled your gown and gloves for you. But typically, we have to think about ourselves and so that's one of the things that you'll have to get, a gown for yourself and gloves for yourself. And they are going to go on this mayo stand. So you're gonna open everything. The gown is gonna get opened onto the mayo stand. Your gloves are gonna get opened onto the top of that. In the gown, there is a towel. It's a paper towel that is in there. And so you'll have gown and towel and you'll have your gloves. Now you're gonna go wash for about 10 minutes. It's a very serious thorough wash from fingertips to two inches above your elbow. You're gonna do that outside of the operating room where the scrub sinks are. You're gonna do that. You're gonna come uh, or I guess you can use the waterless scrub depending on where you're at uh, in your day. And then you're gonna come into the operating room and the first thing that you're gonna grab is your towel. Towel's gonna be the first thing. Now if you scrubbed, you got water dripping from your elbows, you want to make sure that you wait a little bit because you don't wanna drip water onto your, um, your field, your sterile field. Now, so this, gowning and gloving off the mayo stand is damage control because if you contaminate this space it's only a gown and gloves that wear out but if you contaminate the back table that's where you've opened up all of your supplies that's thousands of dollars that just got flushed down the drain okay the hospital eats that all right and then you don't get a raise the next year so um, gowning and gloving on the mayo stand, that's why we do it. That's why it's a best practice, okay? So 
Um, you come in, you get your towel, you dry off, you put on your gown. Hopefully somebody's there to affix it in the back. There is a Velcro and a tie, someone who's not sterile. And then you're gonna go ahead and put your gloves on. Okay, and then uh, there's, I can't, I don't know if you can see this little tag right here. Can you guys see that? This is like a, a card. Um, it's probably about four inches wide and about six inches long. And it's attached to the ties on the front of your gown. So this is, this is where turning the gown comes in because at this point it's open in the back. So you're gonna take this card, you're gonna hold the card in your right hand, you're gonna take the string on the left, you're gonna pull the card off the left string and keep it in your hand, and then you're going to pass that card to a friend, probably your circulator. Okay, circulator is gonna take the card with the long string that's still attached to it, go around your back, come over to your left, you're going to grab the string, they're going to pull the card away, and you're going to tie your gown at the side. And that's how that all works. And if you can see that this part of the card looks white, and this part of the card looks like a darker purple or brown, that <coughs> is to signify where the circulator is holding and where you're holding when you go to pass it off, right? Because you're sterile and they're not. So you want to have your hand on the back of the card and they're going to grab at the front of the card and they're going to help you turn that gown. We call it dance sometimes. Do you want to dance? Um, and then at that point, um, we can discard our trash uh, or the circulator can. And then we can go to our table and start getting our stuff ready for surgery at our back table. Okay, having said all of that, what do you guys have to say? So the uh, paper or whatever that is on the mail stand, is that considered non-sterile? So we use the same principles. So whatever is on the flat top surface is still sterile, as long as we didn't contaminate it in some way when we were getting our gown or gloves. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. I was just wondering, because like, if that came from the gown itself, I mean, it could potentially be unsterile at that point, maybe? Well, the underneath is, that's going to be touching the mayo stand, but this top space, remember how we said within a one inch margin is sterile, mm -hmm. and then anything that falls over is not. So that's the same premise. At this point, it's still sterile, um, and we can discard that ourselves by just grabbing it in the very middle like in the very center and then just holding it like that and going to the trash can and dropping it in. And I always say, pretend like the trash can is like a dirty toilet seat that you don't want to sit on. Like you want to hover. You don't want to put your hand down close to the trash can. You just want to go like shoulder level out and drop into the trash can and you should be good. Okay, thank you. Yep. What else? Nothing else? This is what you're gonna be doing for a living? Can you say one more time on, you said the tag, and then you said the tag that's on the gown, you said you return it to the right side and has the string that the circulator knows who will get to it. I, I don't know if I'm missing it. I think I'm missing mm -hmm. some other stuff. Yep, um, let me see if I can find you a visual. Hold on one second. Sometimes a picture is worth a million words. I don't know. Turning the surgical gown. I don't know if there's something out there. Who knows what we'll get. Okay. Hallelujah. Okay. So um, hopefully this will be helpful. So when you put your gown on, see this nice non-sterile young lady is going to do the Velcro at the back. And there's two ties that are hanging out back here. They're going to tie them. Okay, so that's the first part. The next part is going to be turning the gown. So take a peek at this. Okay, so 
here's the tag and you can see, hopefully you can see it has turning right in the middle, but there's like part of the tail coming out here and part of the tail coming out here. There's like two holes in the top, punched in the top. And these strings are threaded through there. So what you're gonna do is with this paw, your right paw, you're gonna grab in the purple colored area, uh, grab the card, and then with this left paw, you're gonna grab the string that is attached on the left side, and you're gonna pull the card off from that string. We're gonna leave it attached to this one, right? Okay, so that's the first thing. And then, where did I go? Uh, here. Okay, so now you see she's pulled the card off. She has it in her right paw, and she's on that back side closest to her. And she has the other string in her left hand. Okay, she's passing it to some non serial person. We know that because there's no glove on this paw right here. You can dance with people that are sterile as well. Um, but uh, typically, this is how we do it because we're the first one that's in the sterile field. And so the circulating nurse is going to take that or whoever's not sterile, surgeon could dance with you if they're not sterile, uh, anybody that's in the room can. And they're gonna take that. And then they are going to walk around you and still holding the card, see it there? They're gonna bring the string to your left side. And then, thanks Tori. Um, and then once you grab it, then they're gonna pull the card away and you're gonna tie at your left side. That's the way it's gonna go. It might not always be white, Alyssa, but you're gonna grab the half that's closest to the string, right? Because you wanna stay as, we're supposed to be how many inches away, sterile to non-sterile? 12 to 18. Yes, sir, 12 to 18. That is not possible here. So you want to stay as far back on the side closest to you, and then your whoever person is going to grab on the card closest to them. Does that make sense? I think typically our part is white, but I just hate for you to attach that um, to what we do instead of just knowing that you want to stay as far back closest to yourself uh, as the sterile person and the non-sterile person is going to stay as far away from you as possible, if, if that makes sense. I think there's so many steps and it's not that we don't understand why they're important. Me, myself, I'm just worried about the execution part and not contaminating anything in the process of, of gowning and setting up and things like that. I think that's where my nerves are a little shaky. Yeah, for sure. And that's okay if you contaminate. That's perfectly fine. Like, if you can just tell yourself, like, this is just the way it's going to be. Like, we're going to have some stumbles before we learn to walk uh, and then run. And we're going to do it in baby steps, right? So first, we're going to learn to scrub. We're going to learn to scrub, and we're going to practice scrubbing, practice, practice, practice. And then... We're gonna learn how to dry, then we're gonna learn how to put on the gown, then we're gonna practice putting on our gloves. So it'll be like baby steps and there'll be lots of practicing. But yes, you're gonna mess up, you're gonna contaminate, you're gonna rip a gown, you're gonna rip a glove, you're gonna drop a tag, you know, especially since we're reusing things um, so like gowns, we, we reuse a few times and they're single use items, like something is bound to happen. Um, and so just kind of going in knowing that and then hopefully getting some sort of peace in your soul, knowing that from now, between now and when you go to your clinicals, like when you go to your clinicals, scrub, gown, glove, you won't even have to think about it. It will no longer be a thinking thing. Like we have practiced it so much that, um, you have other things to think about at this point, right? So that those things need to get to a, a point where they're muscle memory, and that just comes with practice. But yeah, it, it's a ton of steps, and it's crazy. And I remember thinking, 
with my first small little group of three little ducklings. And I had to teach this closed gloving with the gowning. And I had this thought in my brain, like how do you teach someone to breathe? Like that is how innate scrub gown and glove is to me. I don't even have to think about, I don't have to think about breathing. You guys don't have to think about it. Um, but to break that down. And so we'll definitely cook it down and we'll practice it a lot. Um, but I want to, to, to look at Tori's video. And thank you, Tori, for finding it. Let's take a peek at that really quick before we finish up. Yes, videos are good. I agree. The Cardinal Health Amy 4 surgical gown yelling? is used for clinician coverage during surgical procedures. Place right and left. Hold on, I need to make it big. Okay. Hands under respective flaps with side stamp facing chest. Slowly open arms and allow the gown to unfold toward the floor. Slide arms into sleeves as far as possible without compromising sterile technique. The individual donning the gown should be assisted by a second clinician who should ensure adequate fit by pulling the gown over the shoulders. Secure inside ties of the gown first and then fasten the Velcro neck closure. That's never what we do. We always do the opposite. To secure the front tie, the gowned individual should hand the transfer tab to the second clinician as shown. The Cardinal Health surgical gown offering includes a wide variety of gown sizes and Amy protection levels to suit end user needs. Yay, you did it. Good job. Okay. That's that. What questions do you have? Those are our three principles. Covered those. Just a little bit about scrub gown and glove. Um, we won't be learning scrub gown and glove until SUR 120. So we have a little bit of a time before we learn that. Um, in SUR 140, we're gonna be learning vitals, um, hand wash, open glove, transfer of the patient, some stuff about positioning. Um, I might be leaving something out, but that's the bulk of it. And then 120 is where we learn a lot of our skills, a lot, a lot, a lot. No other questions? Okay, you wanna look at some instruments? Okay, this is gonna be super fun. Um, who remembers what this is? We talked about this last time, right? Self-retaining thingamabob. What's its name? Anyone? Good guess. Wheat lantern is the other one, the other type of self-retaining. That's a great guess. It's not the wheat lantern. It's a retractor. It's a self-retaining retractor. So the retractor would be its category. So that's always something that we need to, for sure. Yeah, good job, Ian Gelpy. Yep, 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 yep. Good job. Ta-da! Gelpy retractor. Category retracting and exposing or retracting and viewing. Yay, good job. Let's see, does this one look familiar? Oh, what's that? When is it? Army Navy retractor. Yeah, good job. Those are Army Navies. Army Navy retractor and they're handheld, right? We have to do the work with our hands. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good job. What about this? Does this look familiar? See if we can get a close to the, the ballpark answer here. Yes, it's a knife handle. Excellent job, Alyssa. Do you remember what number by any chance? Yes, good job. It is a long number three knife handle. And you probably can't make it out. It's difficult for me to make out, but this says three L, three L, three long, right? And we, so we call it a number three, like the little pound sign, the little hashtag sign, number three knife handle. Number three long knife handle. Cutting and dissecting is going to be its category. Excellent job. Let's look at another one. Who remembers what this one is? Isn't that another type of retractor? Yes, ma'am. You got it. Look at what's on the little end here. What would you call this? Pokey one? Yeah, a pokey retractor. <laughs> it's definitely pokey. If you're not careful, it will bite you. Looks just like a hook. Yeah, yep, you're right. That's what it is, a skin hook. That's what we call it, a skin hook. Retracting and exposing, or retracting and viewing. Mm -hmm. Skin hook, sometimes they have two little hooks. Here, we call it a double skin hook or a captain hook. Okay, we haven't seen this one yet. Anybody know this one by any chance? I always like to ask before we say. It's a poker, is it? Yeah, good job, Rulan. That is a coker. Let's, let's look at how it's spelled. So here they're calling them forceps. We don't typically call them forceps, we call them clamps. Okay, so we would call this a coker clamp. Great guess on needle holder, Jacob. That's a good guess. Uh, the thing that gives it away, oh, and this is a grasping holding. Pretty much all of our clamps um, are going to be grasping and holding or clamping and occluding. So this guy is grasping and holding. And do you see its little toothuses? It has that one tooth, two tooth, little combo going on there. That's how we can um, distinguish the coker from other ringed instruments. Okay, so what, what do you think? You're gonna clamp this on delicate tissue or more tougher fibrous tissue? Tougher. Yeah, tougher, right? Like fascia or joint capsule or tendon, something like that. Okay, cochere. Let's look at just a couple more. Now, Jacob, what is this? Did you say needle holder? You were just, you were just, you know, you had a premonition of what was coming next. That's all. Yep. So this guy's a needle holder, and um, it's a Mayo Hagar needle holder, and the category is suturing. Well, they have suturing and stapling here, but we typically refer to it as suturing. Mayo Hagar needle holder, and the way you can tell the Mayo, Mayo, Mayo Hagar is that it's quite a bit heavier, uh, thicker than other needle holders that are related to it. Okay, so it's a heavier needle holder um, and it's used for holding a suture, a suture needle. We'll load a suture needle, lock it onto a suture needle. Okay, let's do one more. Ta-da! What do you think this is? 
kind of hard to tell these apart, honestly. Um, when you're looking at them in the lab, like real in the flesh, you can have that perspective of size. But here, this thing looks like it's this big when really it's probably like this big. So um, this is a clamp and it's referred to as a prile. Were you gonna say that, Rainy, and I stole your thunder? No? Okay. Um, good guess, Tori. Um, yeah, I, it's really similar to a Kelly, Jacob. Yep, you're right. Um, the way that you can tell a difference, and um, just before I switch this back, it's, it's uh, from the family clamping and occluding. Because typically if a vessel is bleeding, this is what we're going to put on it. If they want to clamp, they want to clamp it, right? It's going to occlude, it's going to block off that vessel. It's going to squish it so it won't bleed anymore, okay? So <clears throat> I think when we were in the lab last time, I was telling, um, I was telling everyone that in school, <laughs> we're going to distinguish between Kelly's and Cryles for a test, let's say. But in the field, they're just probably going to call it a hemostat. And anything that is about six inches long and it's curved, that's a hemostat. Okay. Um, but the way you can tell the difference between a Kelly and a Cryle is by looking at the serrations on the jaws. So remember, again, let's talk about anatomy of the clamp. This is the jaw. This is the box lock. These are the shanks. These are the ratchets. And these are the rings. Okay, so the way that we identify clamps, we don't look at anything south of the box lock. The tips, the jaws, that's what's going to tell us what a clamping instrument is or does. So if we look at these jaws, you can see that the serrations go all the way down to the box lock. That is a characteristic of a cryo. A Kelly only has serrations that go about to here, from the tip about halfway, okay? And so what we say out there is um, Kelly only goes halfway. True story. Okay, so if you're looking at the jaws, that's how you can tell the by the serrations. <laughs> you knew that one too, huh, Rulan? Yeah, so there's going to be a lot of these that look the same. There's Kelly's, there's Cryles, there's um, Carmalt's, there's Mayo peons, there's Rochester peons, there's Adson tonsil forceps um, or Adson tonsil clamps, and they all kind of look the same except for maybe how thick they are or how long they are. There's also mosquitoes, so the mosquitoes are exactly like this, but they're smaller. They're, you know, maybe four inch instead of six inch. So they're littler guys, they're finer in the jaws and the tips. Um, and when you line them up, you can see the differences, but in these pictures, it's a little bit difficult. Okay, so that's the cryo. All right, questions about any of those? I think that's gonna pretty much do it for today. I have another meeting at noon. Okay, anything else before I let you loose on the world? Okay, thank you for coming today. Thank you for your...